The sun is essentially a plasma ball. It has a core with a temperature reaching 23.5 million degrees Fahrenheit and pressure of more than 340 billion atmospheres. Under these conditions, thermonuclear reactions are taking place inside the sun, and in the process, hydrogen is converted into helium. When that happens, energy is created, which rises from the core to the visible surface of the sun, the photosphere. Changes occur. The plasma cooling on the surface to about 10,000 degrees plunges deep into the star, while other substances rise to the top. This method of energy transfer is called convection. It is similar to water boiling in a kettle. We heat it up from below, and as the water gets hotter, it rises, cools down, and then the steam descends again to be reheated. The same principle applies to the sun. Solar plasma is an ionized substance consisting of charged particles, which means an electric current can be present. Due to its movement, a magnetic field is created, like winding an electromagnet. The magnetic field of the sun is variable, non-uniform. Periodically, its giant loops come to the surface of the star. Strong magnetic fields inhibit the movement of plasma from the nucleus to the surface. It loses heat faster, resulting in sunspots, which are about 2100 degrees cooler than the surrounding areas. Therefore, they seem dark to us, although they still emit bright light. These spots are like magnetic field tracers local magnetic fields, and the evolution of the magnetic field is traced along them. The sun is known to experience an 11-year cycle of solar activity, although 11 years is an average period. It can vary from 8 to 14 years. In this cycle, the activity of the sun changes from minimum to maximum. The solar minimum is the quietest period in the 11-year cycle. When there are fewer sunspots, and during the maximum, the number of sunspots is greater. Their appearance provokes flares on the surface of the star, plasma emissions and shock waves, generally called solar wind. As a result, a stream of ionized particles flies away from the sun at speeds of up to 750 miles per second. Sometimes this radioactive wind blows in the direction of Earth, and then its path is blocked by a natural shield the magnetic field of Earth. When a shock wave like that collides with the magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetic field begins to be disturbed. It vibrates, trembles. This is what is known as a magnetic storm. Magnetic storms are divided now into about five classes. The fifth and strongest class happens a couple of times each solar cycle. Storms that might make their way into history books occur once in two to three cycles. These are like strong earthquakes. There are nine-point Richter scale earthquakes. There are three-point ones, but nine points is rare. Such large magnetic storms are also rare. Nevertheless, we know that there has never been and never will be an earthquake which can destroy a whole continent. Similarly, there will never be magnetic storms and solar flares which can destroy everything. In fact, the Sun and Earth systems have been fairly stable for four billion years. And even such phenomenon as the Carrington event do not affect our planet's protective magnetic field in the long term. But how to explain the interruption in telegraph communication across Europe and North America? The answer is pretty simple. What is a telegraph? This is an open conductor, uninsulated, stretch for hundreds of miles, almost an ideal antenna, and enormous in size. And just as a radio receiver antenna picks up electromagnetic oscillations emitted by radio stations, the telegraph line also catches electromagnetic signals from the sun. Nowadays, there are no open wire lines. Therefore, the modern information network is much more resistant to magnetic storms. And now, in fact, the sun is approaching its minimum level of activity. And this 24th cycle is low, below average even. And therefore, it means that there are going to be very few really powerful flares. And the next cycle, the 25th, is also predicted to be low. This essentially affects the Earth climate, because there is some correlation. When the level of solar activity is low, the climate changes. Such cases have been recorded. There was a period of long-term reduction in the number of sunspots between 1645 and 1715. Rivers in Europe started to freeze back then. 
heavy rains and unusually severe winters led to several harvest failures and orchards dying out in England, Scotland, northern France, and Germany. The mechanism of the solar wind's influence on the Earth's climate is rather complicated. The Earth often experiences falling streams of cosmic rays from the galaxy and charged particles arising from the explosion of supernova stars. This galactic wind is much faster than solar wind, and it has more energy. When charged particles enter the Earth's atmosphere, they help water vapors condense, which contribute to cloud compaction. But when the solar activity is high, a strong solar wind can sweep out these rays, and in such a sophisticated way, solar activity reduces cloudiness, and cloudiness affects the Earth's albedo, that is, its ability to reflect light. Simply speaking, when the sun is active, the atmosphere is transparent and more heat enters it, and vice versa. When activity is lower, there are more clouds and decreasing heat fluxes. Data from the SOHO Space Observatory testify to the abnormal calmness of the sun. The instruments placed on the spacecraft showed that the total amount of energy emitted by our star in the current cycle was lower than in the previous. In general, this gives scientists something to ponder. In Russia, solar activity is predicted in the city of Truitsk, near Moscow. We are at the main console of the Center for Space Weather Forecasts at the Institute of Terrestrial Magnetism, Ionosphere, and Radio Wave Propagation of the Russian Academy of Sciences, or ISMORAN for short. For 20 years, they've been watching the sun around the clock. The main tools are satellites, and the higher the satellites, the better. There are currently three American satellites, too, flying at a liberation point, where the gravitational forces of the sun and Earth are balanced. This is a million miles away. It constantly flies there and rotates around the sun together with the Earth, and it always faces the sun. We are happy to use them because they are the main tools. In the global scientific community, there's a constant exchange of data on the state of the sun. An automatic system for predicting solar weather is based on them. The automatic system gives us a forecast. We have a team of analysts here all the time. Well, usually three people. We discuss it all and say, now there's something wrong. We need to take some other factors into account. Even the US can't work with an automatic system. And in the meantime, the expert's assessment plays a big role. We change the input parameters, change all sorts of things, and we adjust the system until we think that this forecast is right. We press the button, and the machines send it to all consumers. The next day, we come and check how wrong we have been. But most of the time, we can rejoice in the work we do. Modern tracking systems allow us to make a relatively accurate forecast for the entire 11-year solar cycle, for a year, a month, a week, but mostly short-term forecasts are in demand for several days and even hours. The plasma from a flare takes from 1.5 to 3 days to fly. In half of the cases, the emission does not fall on the Earth, and then the forecast is declined. Then, if we observe the solar plasma near Earth, and the solar wind that has reached Earth already, we can make a forecast for one, two, or three hours. It is rather important for some technical devices that can't be turned off for a long time. And the forecast is most likely to be sent to special customers, industries that have a particular interest in this. First of all, solar weather does not affect people and other living beings, but technological devices and various communication networks, pipelines, power lines, railways are affected by it. During a magnetic storm, the same processes occur in them as in the Faraday loop. If a coil's magnetic field changes next to it, we'll have an induction current. And even small changes to the magnetic field lead to a very large current. For example, in the Alaskan pipeline, the current can reach 1,000 amperes. So what would happen to the pipeline? It destroys the anti-corrosive layers. Because the pipe is in a horizontal position, it is at a certain angle to the Earth, so that the ions fall and do not rust. But when there's a current, it destroys this protection. And if the pipe has been designed to last for 15 years, then after three years it begins to rust due to this effect if it is neutral. In the case of railroads, currents can cause a false alarm with signals. This was discovered by Izmiran scientists when they were studying problems on the Russian railway system. If a section of the railroad is free, 
a certain potential difference is maintained between the rails. When a train appears between them, an electric current begins to flow. The electric current induced by variations of the Earth's magnetic field can lock the rails, which the system will read as another train on the track. As a result, the green light turns red. And although this won't cause a collision, it creates logistical problems. It's much more dangerous when large electrical grids fall victim to strong magnetic storms. As for power lines, there is a good example of this. The blackout in Quebec on March 13, 1989, when there was a flare on the sun. It led to a magnetic storm, and the entire province of Quebec, including the capital of Canada, Ottawa, was disconnected from electricity for nine hours. All because the system had accumulated an induction current. It first disconnects the relay, then burns the transformers. And here we have protection against lightning grounding our electrical object. But this current still flows through the soil due to salts acting as a conductor. And it flows through the earth and until reaching other energy systems and transformers and burns them. The consequences of the Quebec blackout not only caused a power outage in millions of Canadian homes, but radio communications were lost too, while people across the world witnessed the Northern Lights, where previously they hadn't appeared. The magnetic field of our planet is most vulnerable around the North and South Poles. There, its lines enter Earth almost vertically. That is, those processes in the magnetosphere, which occur hundreds of miles above the equator, take place in the lower layers of the atmosphere close to the poles. And this creates many technical problems. In the regions of the far north, a strong magnetic storm creating interference can almost completely block radio broadcasts for several days. Also, solar activity creates problems for satellite navigation systems. Space weather also greatly influences various technical systems. It actually affects the accuracy of GPS. Since it's based on the propagation of radio waves, the influence of space weather changes and sometimes leads to errors. In reality, an error can be off by up to 300 feet. Of course, this is really huge, especially when the systems are designed to be precise to the nearest half an inch. Landing a plane on autopilot mode, for example, even an error of just a few feet can be catastrophic. Again, a magnetic storm interferes with radio communications. Therefore, for air traffic controllers and pilots, the solar weather forecast is just as important as an ordinary weather forecast, especially when it comes to so-called transpolar flights. To save time and fuel, flights from Europe to Japan, for example, are often directed over the North Pole, and this can cause a number of problems. During the flight, the plane communicates with the controller via satellite. Geostationary satellites have poorly visibility from the poles, so the aircraft flies over the pole using shortwave communication. If there is no shortwave connection, due to a magnetic storm, the route of the aircraft is shifted to lower latitudes, and this costs money. During magnetic storms, the Earth's magnetic field is weaker, so it doesn't protect us from cosmic radiation, and above all, its impact is the strongest approximately at altitudes of 32,000 feet. And this is the altitude used by commercial civil aviation. Therefore, in recent years, the International Civil Aviation Organization has required airlines to take into account the radiation load on the crews of aircraft that fly specifically on transpolar routes. However, people and technology are protected both by the magnetic field and the atmosphere. Magnetic storms are much more dangerous while orbiting Earth. During such events, high-energy particles, electrons, sometimes even protons, which affect electronic devices, appear near our planet. They are known as killer electrons, electrons with certain energy forms, which appear in the magnetosphere or come from the sun in some cases. Well, they simply destroy electronics and knock satellites off the grid. And as you can imagine, it comes at a great cost when a satellite stops working. As a result, about 200 satellites are lost per year. 
but a lot depends on them now. Communication, television, internet, navigation, not to mention a country's defense and security. In many ways, this is why it's necessary to have a streamlined system for predicting magnetic storms and evaluating their consequences. The problem is that the atmosphere swells during a magnetic storm. It is heated by currents and dense layers rise up. As a result, where the ISS is in orbit, at an altitude of about 250 miles, a large amount of rarefied air appears, which halts the station's motion. It loses speed and altitude. The same happens to some low-flying satellites. One magnetic storm can make the station fall six miles in its orbit. It is necessary to keep this in mind in order to plan the delivery of fuel and raise the orbit again. Otherwise, it might be too late, as was the case with the Skylab, an American near-Earth space station, which studied the sun. It fell into the ocean, so this can be a very serious problem. Therefore, in Russia, there is a domestic warning system for hazardous situations in near-Earth space. Every day, using solar weather forecast, trajectories are calculated for all satellites in the Earth's orbit so that they do not slow down, fall, or collide with each other. If necessary, measures are taken to adjust their orbits. In fact, modern cosmonautics depends almost entirely on solar activity. A forecast for 55 days, that's because it's the amount of time it takes the sun to revolve around its axis. We send it to ballisticians at the Flight Control Center. For all the launches that might take place under our infrastructure support, we can say what day will be bad and what day will be suitable. So they plan accordingly. When they accept the plan, it comes to us, and five days before the launch, we go to the State Commission, which makes the decision on the exporting the launch pad then refuel and press the button. Solar flares are dangerous, not only for technology, but also for astronauts, because these are streams of accelerated radioactive particles. In 2003, consecutive flares and a stream of particles penetrated the orbit of the ISS, but fortunately missed the station. This could have led to the failure of a number of devices and life support systems, as well as radiation exposure of crew members, tens and even hundreds of times higher than the norm. In general, during periods of high solar activity, astronauts are often recommended to move to an ISS compartment with increased security. After all, radiation in space should be taken very seriously. Spacewalks are especially dangerous. The schedule of outboard work coincides with a powerful event on the sun. Then the astronaut can receive a fatal dose of radiation. For example, the Americans during moon flights between 1972 and 1976 were not fully aware of the dangers, and they miraculously dodged the radiation. In 1972, there was one of the largest outbreaks that had ever been recorded by scientists. Therefore, this is a significant issue, especially when we want to keep on flying. It is clear that even now, with the current level of technology, we can't live constantly on the moon, in interplanetary space, without any additional means of protection. Humanity is fortunate that the Earth has such a powerful and stable magnetic field. However, it is possible that solar activity can still affect us. This idea was put forward by Russian scientist Alexander Chizhevsky at the beginning of the 20th century. Since then, research in this field has been actively conducted in Russia. However, the results are contradictory. A number of experts argue that a person is dependent on solar weather, that solar flares cause headaches, high blood pressure, anxiety, stress. On the other hand, during the years of the solar maximum, humanity lives under moderate and severe storms up to 50% of the time. And in 75 years of life, the average person lives through a total of 2,250 storms. Actually, if you look at the energy contribution, deviations, anomalies of solar activity, this is an insignificant part of what the sun produces. Totally insignificant. And organisms have become accustomed to this during evolution. Yeah, you and I have developed a mechanism to adapt to increased radiation. We tan in the sun. Our bodies immediately begin to respond to increased radiation. Simply put, minor changes to solar activity are not dangerous for us. Indeed, magnetic storms have no direct impact on human life, 
But on the other hand, under their influence, changes occur in the environment. For example, atmospheric pressure, and naturally, the human body reacts to it. There are statistics which claim that during large magnetic storms, the number of heart attacks and strokes increases by about 20%. This is reflected in the well-being of all people. But young, healthy, cheerful people have a number of protective mechanisms. Weak people, so to speak, senior people who are the first to react to this, especially those who have cardiovascular conditions. Therefore, we work alongside doctors. We have patented a method in this area called a way to combat magnetic storms for individuals with myocardial infarction and hypertension. And it explains how to deal with it. Get our forecast and take medicine as prescribed by doctors. When the storm ends, stop. To do this, we have two telephone answering machines. People can call us free of charge round the clock to find out about the state of the geomagnetic field and the forecast. The issue of solar weather's influence on the human body requires additional research. Although the sun has been studied by astronomers for a long time, it still harbors many mysteries. For example, why the duration of a solar cycle can vary from 8 to 14 years? And why has the wolf number, which measures the number of sunspots, varied from 45 to 190 in the last 300 years? To answer these questions, Ismaran and Roscosmos are preparing a new space mission to the sun. Now the project, Interheliozone, is being developed. It is aimed at studying all these problematic issues of solar physics, studying space weather, its impact on Earth, and so on. This year and next year, other agencies, NASA and the Institute for Systems Analysis at the Russian Academy of Sciences, are planning to launch spacecraft which will get closer to the Sun, because all the possibilities of studying the Sun from the orbit of the Earth have already been exhausted to a large degree. The Interheliozon satellite will study the sun and the near solar environment from a distance of 26 to 30 million miles. The satellite will investigate solar active phenomena and related effects, the corona of the sun and the solar wind, the polar regions and the heliosphere. Perhaps in the near future, mankind will learn to predict space weather down to the minute. Without this, the further development of astronautics, the study and colonization of other planets of the solar system is simply impossible. My name is Vladimir Surdin. See you next time on A Guide to the Universe.